Greetings, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I'm just sitting here <laughs> in my home getting ready to host the, I guess, second to last conversation for NBT at home. I've got some really spectacular folks with me here who can reveal yourselves <laughs> to the world. Um, and then we're gonna get this party started. Yeah, yes. Look at these, look at these reveals. Oh, it's so theatrical. I love it. I loved it. That was awesome. That's a brand new thing. We've we've never done that before. So thank you for thanks for trying well, that out. Proclamation. <laughs> um, fantastic. I am Chelsea D. I'm a co-curator and moderator with the National Black Theater, and we are here for MBT at Home Founders Month edition where we're talking to cohorts of these incredible black makers and, and innovators and ooh, just all the wonderful, delicious things. We have a, co a collection of conversations we've been having to celebrate Dr. Barbara Ann Tier and the founding of the National Black Theater. So today with me, I've got some amazing, amazing, amazing people who Ah, there's just that there, we're gonna we're gonna get we're gonna get into all these things, but there's just so much reverence and admiration and just delight that y'all's work has brought me personally. So I'm very glad to be here and and thank you for thank you for thank you for showing up and uh, being on this Zoom call. <laughs> uh, so I did want to talk hello. about create. Yes, hello. Would you what did you say? AJ? I said, thanks for having us. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is like a, a powerhouse collection of folks. Um, and, and these are people who have been creating new futures, creating new paths, creating radically free spaces. Um, and so y'all are very much a part of the legacy of the National Black Theater, very much a part of what's what we envisioned for how we're going to move forward. So... Um, something that we're, uh, okay, sorry. I'm just getting various messages from folks. Um, but something that I wanted to let folks know about is the National Black Theater Vision Forward Fund, looking to fortify, ground, and imagine yet another 50 years for the National Black Theater. I'll talk more about that at the end of our chat, but check out our website page um, to learn more about what we're trying to do. We're trying to start an archive so that we can preserve Dr. Tears' technology of soul that she was creating when she was creating the National Black Theater so that we can support the artists that we commission um, and so that we can have greater capacity to do all the work that we really, really, really need to be doing. So that's gonna be something we're gonna talk about a little bit later, but for now, I wanna introduce you all, if you don't know, to the fantastic folks we have with us. This is a symposium of healers, makers, Truth speakers, music makers, earth shakers. Okay, I was told to keep these introductions short. Um, so um, I'm, I'm gonna try to do that. But I want to give honor to what y'all have done and, and, and folks need to know like who's in the space. So please, if you don't know these, these folks, Google them a little bit more deeply, but I'm gonna give you a quick uh, top line. I, I, I mean, there's, how do we even, <laughs> top line version of these things. Um, but everyone here is too, too dope. First, I'm gonna start us off with Adrienne Marie Brown, author of Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change, Changing World, and the co-editor of Octavia's Brood, Science Fiction from Social Justice Movements. She is a writer, social justice facil facilitator, pleasure activist, healer and doula living in Detroit. She was also the subject of one of those three portrait series that we had from Makiba Keeds Rainey. This is Adrian Marie Brown. Welcome, 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 welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. That self-portrait thing, I didn't know what was happening while I was away. And when I saw it, I lost my like whole poop. Anyway, I don't know how to freaking curse, but it was, yeah, it was very important for me. So thanks for having me. I'm so grateful. I think Barbantier is amazing. I'm grateful to be part of this legacy of what the National Black Theater is building. So thank you. Yay. 
Okay, I'm gonna move on to Toshi Reagan. Toshi Reagan, singer, composer, musician, curator, and producer with a profound ear for sonic Americana, from funk to folk, from blues to rock. And when I tell you, when I tell you, Toshi's music was, was it is so authentic to the American sound and it is such a gumbo sonically of all the things that we are and have created and throughout time, I mean, it's like, also, Toshi, your mom's voice was the soundtrack of my childhood. So it's very much like full circle, mo mom's energy, you know, it, it's all here this evening. So Toshi Reagan, welcome. So glad to have you, so glad to have you. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much. Can't wait to get into it. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, and Kendra Frazier, the founding executive director of the Hope Center, a free mental health facility located in central Harlem of New York City. Reverend Frazier is the founder and CEO of KYND, that stands for Knowing Yourself in Need of Devotion. KYND offers trauma-informed care through a variety of services, from clinical therapy for individuals, families, and couples to trauma-informed trainings for ecclesial communities and corporate entities. Known for her work in removing barriers to mental health access for communities of color, I am honored to welcome you, Kendra, here for this. Hello, 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 hello. Thank you, thank you. So <laughs> grateful to be here and kind, thank you. Kind, <laughs> kind, there you go. Yes, Kind, yes. spelled K-Y-N-D. The first four letters of my name. Oh, I <laughs> ah, see how you did that there. Okay. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh, <laughs> amazing. You're in the work that you've, you've, you've done with kind and what, I mean, trauma informed is definitely a phrase I'm hearing a lot more of. People are starting to think about what does it mean to be trauma informed? So um, really happy to have you here to speak to what that is and what that means. Now we're gonna move into our check-in portion. We got some check-in questions here. Um, I wanna know your accessibility. How are you feeling today? Is there anything you need? Is there anything you need folks to know about where you are right now? Um, and this can be uh, your accessibility physically, emotionally, mentally, wherever you are in the space, just let us know so we can be of greatest support to you. Uh, the second thing I wanna hear about is any updates on any projects or anything you want folks to know that you're doing, uh, we'd love to know. Uh, and then the, the, the third thing is thinking about pleasure activism. What is bringing you pleasure right now? Um, and, and to explain a little bit more about pleasure activism is the person who wrote the book on this, Adrienne Marie Brown. Can you tell us about pleasure activism? Like what are some things folks need to, to understand about this amazing concept? and framework. Sure, um, you, at, the, at the sort of nutshell of it is that pleasure is not frivolous. It is a measure of our freedom. That's one of the core pieces of it. And pleasure activism is the work that we do to uh, heal ourselves from the ways that oppression has taught us that we don't deserve pleasure, that we don't deserve joy, that we have to work constantly and labor constantly and produce constantly in order to ever access our two weeks of vacation, our you know retirement when we're 65 and then we finally can sit somewhere and fish or relax or whatever. And it's like no, most of us aren't making it that far. We're not making it that far with any joy. Um, and I tie it to that James Baldwin quote, your your crown has already been bought and paid for. It's like you, your, our ancestors labored in a way that, that they can, we can't really repay that. One of the things that they earned for us is the right to have rest and joy and pleasure. And it's also our survival technology, um, being able to laugh and have music and be alive. Um, it's really rooted in the work of Audre Lorde and the uses of the erotic as power, that idea that once you experience that full erotic awakening and that it's flowing through you, it becomes impossible to settle for suffering and self-negation. And 
I feel like it's so important in this moment, our movements are pleasure activism outbursts, right? Like you go, you look in any direction at people in the street and it's like, there's an irresistible force. So we wanna become that irresistible force. Um, and it also asks us to look at sex and drugs and the things that give us pleasure and make sure we're also aligning those with our values, right? That it's like, there's nothing to be ashamed of about seeking pleasure. How has it been legislated into these arenas where we feel shame and guilt and hiding? Everybody's smoking weed. Everybody's fucking or doing sex. I don't know. <laughs> Are we allowed to curse Chelsea D? Yes, yes. Okay, well, everybody's doing it. So yeah. all these things are happening, but everyone's acting like it's still supposed to be a secret. And mm -hmm. in the places where we don't discuss it, we can be transgressing against ourselves, transgressing against our values, transgressing against our, our what we deserve. So it's all of those things in a nutshell. Ooh, yes. <laughs> That's it. Um, and I was like, if I have the, the person who is who who introduced the world to pleasure activism and, and this new framework of thinking about it, I have to have you explain what it is. It's so, so, so fantastic. Uh, okay, and then the fourth check-in, we're still in the check-in. And the fourth question, <laughs> check-in question is, in y'all's opinion, you know, one by one, what does the world need a revival of right now? And to give us a little bit of a working definition, a little context about what is a revival, what has it traditionally been, um, what has it culturally been, how has it worked for Black people and communities of color, um, I would love, Kendra, for you to talk to us a little bit about what is a revival and what has it meant. Revival. I can talk about revival through storytelling a bit. So I grew up in the Church of God. At Siegel Avenue First Church of God, where my great grandmothers helped charter the church over 115 years ago. So I'm a church kid, grew, grew up, I'm a child of the 80s, and I, I remember being a revival, a revival being literally an opportunity for you to restore your soul for you to restore your life. It would be a week out of the year that we would have it where we would bring on a guest preacher. That guest preacher would typically preach for um, that whole week. And then we would be introduced to new choirs. Sometimes it would be our home choir and then other times it would be visiting choirs. And you know, I grew up in the area where a good processional would take place. So I always would look forward to those processionals and the choir in their robes walking down the aisle and always hearing a, a new word to heal my soul and my mind in that time. And so I believe that the revival that we're in right now is a revival, a call to walk more deeply into our own light. And in order to walk more deeply into our own light as spirit beings, as God beings, we have to deal with our shadows. And so this is a season where we're being revived out of the, the dead walking that we've been doing in the world. Um, I know that Adrian mentioned earlier before we came on camera, this new relationship with time that she has. Um, for me, time has become something that I can relish in because I'm no longer attached to the institutions that had me bound in ways that kept me from seeing my own brilliance, in ways that kept me from seeing that the energy that I poured into institutions, I needed to pour into my own work. So that is what revival looks like in this time. Yeah. <laughs> I got to hit it with you. Make me preach on it. Adrian, don't do it. <laughs> uh, so actually, let's just let's let's start with you, Kendra, for 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 a check in, um, and you'll just answer all those all those questions. And don't worry, I'm here, so just ask, and I'll I'll tell I'll remind you what what question you're on. Um, but just to start us off, your accessibility. How are you doing coming into the space today? Um, and any project updates or anything you want people to know about perhaps of kind or any, any other efforts that you're doing? Absolutely. I, um, in this moment, am feeling revived, no pun intended, as well as um, restored. These past couple of months have been hard for me. Um, holding all that I hold as a spiritual leader, as well as a clinical therapist, a clinical social worker. Um, I had a great acupuncture session yesterday and he, he placed some needles in some places that help reset my system. So I'm feeling reset right now. 
Um, in terms of the project that I want to lift up, I am working with an amazing filmmaker, Katina Parker, um, on a project that we are calling a Love Supreme Black, Queer, and Christian in the South. Um, Katina and I have been working on this film project for um, almost five years, and we are in the midst of fundraising to finish up our production. This documentary series follows eight families, Black families, who have LGBTQ folks in their family systems who found ways to love beyond the limits of their prejudice, to love beyond um, the theological, poor theological suppositions they've heard from their pulpit, juxtapose the love that they have for their LGBTQ family members. And some of them are still wrestling. My family is in it. Um, and so I'm so grateful for the other folks that have decided to be collaborators on the film. To find out more about A Love Supreme, you can go to www.alovesupremedoc.com. Yeah. And do you want me to answer the rest of the questions too? Yes, I, I, I and I was a little gotcha. bit late because I was going gotcha. to. So, so speaking about God. pleasure <laughs> activism, um, yeah. what I am taking the time to love on myself as well as um, experience love in ways that I haven't before, a love that's very honest, a love that's filled with integrity, a love that calls me back to myself every time I endeavor in it. And it's really ultimately healing work. And healing work is a process and it's a journey. So I've been doing my work and committed to doing my work. And my work sometimes looks like meditation. My work sometimes look like, looks like Netflixing and chilling. Um, my work sometimes looks like business meetings for my consulting company. Um, and then it also looks like making love sometimes. So my work looks like many things. So that's where I am. Um, and yes. yeah, I think great answer number four. Yeah, you yeah. you you answered number four. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, uh, and I love that the work can look different. Any you know at any point at any um at any point in this process. So change is always always happening. Uh, okay, Adrian, let's 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 move to you. Give us uh, your accessibility and um, any projects updates. I'm so lit up by the sexy reverend. I'm just over here like, woo, okay. Um, this is just great. This is the new gospel. So my accessibility needs are really good right now. Um, a little chilly because I'm at my parents' house. And so it's like air conditioning and the news are two constant presences here. But I love being here. I love being with them. Um, I feel every day more and more the preciousness of getting to be with my family and that they are meeting a lot of my accessibility need because they're in one of the lower intensity COVID places in the country and they're like opening their home to me and my partner to be here with them. So it's been incredible. You know, I'm getting like mama care every day. And um, I took a beautiful Qigong class last night and I'm just like really being like, how do I keep finding my way into my body as my body shifts and changes? So. I'm doing good. Um, projects that I want to uplift in this moment. Um, there's two, two or three. I'm always working on a lot of pots. So um, one thing I want to uplift is I I do two podcasts. One is called How to Survive the End of the World, and, and my sister Autumn is my co-host on it. And while I was away, I just was away for six months on sabbatical, she focused the whole thing on an apocalypse survival series that is like a how-to book. Like it really feels like, you know, Octavia will be like, yep, that's good. So it's, I wanna keep, I just point people to it. It just, AV, the AV Club just uplifted it as one of their top podcasts of 2020. And it really is like, I, and I say that like, I'm like, maybe I should go away more often, but I'm like that, was the best word, the best of the podcast has ever been. Um, the other podcast I'm a part of is with Toshi Regan, the one and only, the original, um, and it's called Octavia's Parables. And we are reading Octavia together, chapter by chapter, with analysis, summaries, and questions to hold for yourself in, in community. So I'm also finishing a book on emergent strategy facilitation. So like tomorrow I'm gonna click send on the next iteration of it going into the editors. And I love writing books. So I think in books these days. And so there's always like some book brewing in me. Um, 
when I think of pleasure, what's bringing me pleasure right now, I'm also on Operation Make a Lot of Love during the apocalypse. Um, so I've been making sure that I have, um, that I'm responsible for my own daily pleasure, giving pleasure, receiving pleasure, and then resting into deep presence. So I've been really trying to, to be like, how, you know, I'm around my parents. How do I be present with my parents? How do I find the pleasure of connection here? And for years, I don't know about y'all, but for years, there's a way I can orient towards my parents. Like, I know everything and let me tell y'all things and you don't, you know, you can't control me, whatever. All this rebellion that it can come back if you only see your parents a couple times a year, you know, it can come back in quickly. And I've just been letting that fall away and being like, I get the pleasure of this relationship as adults and how do I lean into that? Um, and then the pleasure of creating. You know, I wake up every day and I'm like, this day is mine. I crafted my life. I boxed things out. I set boundaries. And now this is my time. And what do I want to create? And I really feel like my whole life is a ritual. My whole life is a pleasure right now. And it's, I mean, I literally, I, I, I was mentioning this before, but it has shifted my relationship to time because I keep telling people, I'm like, we don't know how long we have. This is always true, but the, the pandemic has made it more present that we don't know how long we have and we can't make plans the way we used to because we don't know what the conditions are gonna be. So right now is suddenly truly, really clearly, oh, this is what I have. And inside of that, I wrote my friends and I was like, I feel like I'm on mushrooms all the time because I'm so attentive and everything feels magical, but I'm just walking around, this is how life is. So it's great. Um, and then the revival. So. I really liked this question because my first thought was like, we're in the revival, like the world is like the revival is like going. But then I was like, well, no, if I really was going to tune into that, like from my my organizer movement heart, um, two things jumped up for me. One was a commitment to self transformation um, that we're in a moment where it's very easy right now to point to be pointing at everyone and being like, this needs to change and you need to change and you need to change and you need to transform. And inside of that, it can be very easy to relinquish the part that is actually necessary, the thing that we can only change, which is ourselves. And I keep every day being like, how do I have a revival of curiosity about my own self-transformation? Where are those systems of oppression still alive in me? Where are they woven into my cells? What does that detox look like? How do I decolonize? Um, and I wanna see our movements be rigorous about self-transformation in the same way we're rigorous about calling people out and canceling this and everything. I'm like, no, let's be rigorous about each of us can be a harm doer. How do we each step into a new way of being? And that means we need a revival of patience also that just because we're calling things out in this moment doesn't mean it's gonna change right away. So how do we revive that sacred patience in us? That's like, this is the way, this is the path. And it's gonna mean folks putting their foot in their mouth and you being there to be like, let me pull that foot out of your mouth and like in a loving way, how do we stay connected, stay beyond all these constructs, stay human with each other. So those are some of the revivals I'm intrigued by and interested in right now. I'm here. I'm here for that. And that self, that self transformation piece. That that, that that's a word. That's a word. You know, my mentor. I always quote her, but she. My mentor is Grace Lee Boggs, mm -hmm. who lived to be a hundred years and a hundred days old. And she said, "We have to transform ourselves to transform the world." And I just I think about that all the time. Is that I'm like, okay, white supremacy. Where do I need to excise you in me? Okay, capitalism. Where do mm -hmm. I need to? Wish my materialism okay patriarchy where am i still accepting less than i deserve on the dollar okay how do i transform myself so yeah wow so good so rich i'm i'm, I'm so excited i'm so excited toshi to round us off uh let's do your accessibility and and project updates um accessibility uh Let's see, you know, that word is just has so much um, heaviness for me because it usually has to do with, you know, am I able to walk? And, um, and then that's how I think about like, am I able to move? And so I would say like, um, I feel really good because I'm, I'm walking very well right now. And I'm really happy about that. I, I know that's, it's a bit, bit of a wide, wider question, but much of my like 
everything is tied to how well um, I'm walking. And, um, and so, you know, when I'm walking well, I'm not as worried. I'm not as concerned about myself. I'm not as um, careful. Um, I'm, I'm just moving a little bit freer in the world. And so it's ironic uh, to be where, very much homebound. I'm not, I'm not one of the people that's like going out and trying to do everything. So I've been like really, um, you know, operating very close to my home. So, um, yeah, so I feel, I feel really good. I feel really good. I'm a little bit tired today, but I feel really good. It's, a, it's an okay tired. <laughs> and, um, I want to um, uplift uh, absolutely um, Octavia's parables with Adrian. Um, that is that is such an incredible gift and i'm really grateful for it as we both have been so much um uh, a lot of our work is is um on octavia's incredible text that she gave to us and um and we both have read the parable books like probably a hundred times or more and so it's but it's been really good to be in conversation in this particular way chapter by chapter and then um, and have it go out into the world is, is really, really um, incredible. Uh, also tonight I am simultaneously doing <laughs> through the magic of pre-recorded <laughs> performances. Um, there is a great organization called Rock in the Boat and Rock in the Boat, um, you know, teaches kids um, in the Bronx uh, how to um, make boats and, and then like, you know, sail them in the, on the water. And it's, it's an incredible um, organization. My godparents, Pete and Toshi Seeger, really love this organization. And right now they're having, um, it's, it might be a little bit later, but they're having a show to raise money. Um, just go rocking, rocking the boat in the Bronx and, um, and you can find them. I have, I have something about them on my Instagram but it's just a it's a it's a great thing and they've been around for a long time and they keep they stay with their kids so tonight is the alumni award so like once you go through their program they're like walking with you through your life um and doing things really uh really amazing and then um i just uh had a great call with the uh, allied media conference and I'm doing the closing ceremony from the conference. And I just found out today that um, through the generosity of Allied Media Conference, everybody's gonna be able to access um, the closing ceremony, the opening ceremony and some of the plenary. So like, I'm just like, wait, what? What are y'all doing? So this is such great news. This is so amazing. This is such a gift. So um, yeah. Yeah, I think this is this is amazing. So I'll uplift those two things. And then um, pleasure. I am really enjoying my body right now. Like, I'm just so, you know, I, I have I have like things, but like I I'm stayed working out with my trainer virtually. Um, I'm stronger than I've been in a while, like physically. I'm really happy with Toshi. I'm really grateful for her. She's really hanging in there. And um and I would say that I'm really happy for the music journey that I've had during this time. I actually went a month and didn't write or sing or record anything. I've never done that in, in my whole life. And I, I didn't get worried about it. I was just like, okay. Uh, my guitar was looking at me like, hey, you wanna pick me up? And I'd be like, nope, not today. And then all of a sudden just boom, everything um, just, just came forward. Um, so, I've gotten a lot of pleasure um, from the revolution and the uprising. Um, you know, I've got, I've, and, and there's, it just seems like I'm surrounded by people who are very much right now in tune with their spirit and their soul. And, um, and I am really benefiting from that wisdom from my friends. And then I'm just remembering and remembering and remembering and Adrian, I think I'm writing a book. I've written enough stuff where I'm like, it's a book. Like, stop lying. So it's I'm, the book, Toshi. It's a book. It's a book. I'm claiming all of my writing and I'm like, it's a book. So who knows what's gonna happen, but that that is pretty exciting too. Um, the revival question, um, I like everything that was already said. And I think I would say 
um, to, you know, I would love to revive talking to your neighbors. And I know that that feels like really weird in a time when you're, you're, you know, like we're, we're supposed to not be touching each other and not supposed to be close. But I guess, I guess the deeper thing is being mindful of like assumption that information is, is being passed and that assumption that, that everybody is, is on the same page and the assumption that we all have the same things and the assumption, like, like when you get to gather, right, you actually get to hear and experience things at the same time. And so then you can actually feel like, oh, are we all feeling this and hearing this and seeing this? And do people have something to say about it? And, but right now I feel like, you know, a good portion of, of, of um, you know, tribe communication is on social media and it's in blips, it's in blips. And it's, it's in, um, there's a thing about receiving so much information um, through, you know, electric, you know, beams of five sentences that say something. And they're the heaviest things in the world. Like literally every day I am being asked to uplift um, black people who've been murdered. And it's not, you know, and, and I'm trying to remember if there's ever a time where that happened, where it was so many simultaneously and there was no system of communication around it. Like, and before, it's like it was slower and you would get the information, but you would be together and you got to process some of what was happening to you, even as you activate. And I think about my mom telling me there was a song, um, Freedom Singers, the second group used to sing called In the Mississippi. And it basically was like this, this song about how they went to look for civil rights activists who were murdered and they thought they were in the Mississippi River. And then when they went to look for them, they, they kept finding all of these bodies. And that's what's happening to us right now, that like we're, we're looking, we are looking for our people in the same way they did. And as we're looking for our people, we're like finding them. And then when we find them, we're like, we found them and then we're learning like in behind this. And I'm like, well, we maybe need to talk to each other. Um, and revive a, a, our circles and the best we can around this, what we're actually in. And when I, and I have, I can, this thing keeps coming to me. I don't wanna let it slide by. I don't wanna let it slide by. Like I wanna sit in it a little bit and I wanna get testimony and I wanna get soul salvation and I wanna get, um, you know, dealing with these spirits and um, and I want to get care around it, and I think it's possible. And I don't think all of our communication has to be in the gloriousness of, of rallies or the the reception of information. But now, can we talk as neighbors and see where we are and see what else is coming up for us and what else do we have on our minds about what to do about what's happening? So. Oh, so, I mean, just like giving me goosebumps in that you're articulating so much of what I have been experiencing is this like constant download and we, how, when do we have a coming together? I love this reviving our circles. That's really, that's really sticking with me. I have a note, notepad that, um, so occasionally you might see me go, oh, and start, and start writing things down. So if I go, if I lean to the side like this, that means I'm writing down the brilliance that's coming out. Okay, so let's get into, that was just the check-in, y'all. That was just the check-in. <laughs> now let's get into uh, what we're talking about when I say the revival. Uh, and the revival in the legacy of the National Black Theater was a, it was like an experimental theatrical event that she wrote about in the 1960s. Um, I think specifically, let me actually pull up this article. She wrote an article for the New York Times called Theater, um, 1972 actually. So she wrote this article in 1972. Um, and this was a theatrical event that, you know, in terms of manifesting and happening, didn't, it didn't quite get to get to happening. So one thing when MBT was like, Chelsea, want you to co-curate this series, what are these conversations you think could be about? One of the things I was interested in is 
what are the purposes of theater according to Dr. Tears original imagination about it and what is the revival you know and what what was it what was it what was it going to be you know are we now tasked with 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 hat with facilitating that so you know that's what this conversation is really going to be focusing in on today uh, and I wanted to start with talking about Dr. Tears idea about what the purpose of theater was and is. In her concept, the whole purpose of theater is, and, and, and around creating the National Black Theater was yes, creating Black artistic forms as, as I've learned a way of working Blackly. That was something that she was invested mm -hmm. in figuring out. Um, but the reason why she wanted to come up with the cultural, uh, with a Black cultural art form and a Black cultural art standard her whole reason for that was was healing. She was searching for healing around her training in a predominantly European art and predominantly European approach to art and art making, and finding healing within herself to figure out well how do how do I, how am I going to express this? What does this mean to me? So her her core mission was always around healing, um, and we can't have a conversation about building. She would say without moving from a, a place of of healing a seated love affair with life. Um, and so that's something that I really wanted to talk about today, this love affair with life. How, how, how do we come to this place? Um, so one thing we talk about at MBT is radical joy, radical joy, boosting the spiritual immune system um, and feeling the full breadth of your humanity from the pleasure to the pain. And, and someone, someone actually earlier in the conversation series, an original company member, um, one of the original liberators said, that the way that they conceived of soul and the technology of soul is that between pain and pleasure is where soul lives, is where we feel this, this most aliveness. Um, and so thinking about that, I wanna pose the question to the group and, and maybe we could start with Adrienne. Um, what does radical healing and radical joy mean to you? I you know, I love that Angela Davis um, quote around radical means to, to all the way to the root, to grab something from the root or take something at the root. And so for me, when I think about radical joy, radical healing, radical self-love, radical living and aliveness, for me, what it means is that it's something that goes all the way down into the root of myself and the root of my family, the root of my community. and that may mean uprooting things that don't fit into my ecosystem, uh, uprooting things that um, are tangling my joy, right? Uh, trying to stifle my life force. And in this moment, I think so much of what is happening, um, if I look at the explosive, you know, I, I was thinking about Juneteenth, how Juneteenth felt this year, so different for me from how it has often felt um, it's often felt like, oh, this overlooked thing that I'm trying to carve out space for with my folks. This year, it's kind of like me and my folks doing this. Can y'all back up? Everybody's here now? Okay, you know, like, it's so joyful. I mean, like, everybody wants to be part of it. And that irresistible culture, but it's because we've been uprooting, pulling away things that are like killing that tree of Black life and trying to kill that tree of black life, trying to poison us at the root. And the more that we pull out, the more joy becomes available. The more that we show up to the march and it feels like a parade, it feels like a dance. It feels like, um, you know, a voguing session. It feels like, it feels like a celebration of our, of our internal um, fortitude and our internal integrity that, oh, you know, Maya Angelou spoke about that inviolate place and I come back to that often that there's a place inside of us that was not destroyed even under all of this pressure even under all of this toxicity something some joy was untouched at the root and it's still there and for me when I think of healing work the way that I lay hands on another or the way that I lay hands on a room when I'm holding it or on books you know the way that I do my work is to imagine that this thing that I have been told is broken is actually whole and that I have been, the distortion is in my perception, not in the thing. And, or it might be in the perception of this person, of themselves. And that what I can do is, is come in and say, let's go to the root. Where did, you, where did you begin to believe that this was broken in you? And 
what would it look like to remember your wholeness, remember our wholeness, remember that we already belong, you know, it makes me emotional. But when I think of it right now, it's like for black people who are brought here, this question of belonging has been so essential. And it's, it's such a broken feeling to, to know you belong to something and not feel your roots, you know, not be able to root, constantly be displaced, constantly be told that if you ask to belong, you're asking for too much, that you're being uh, hateful. You know, we, we get told we're being hateful because we say our, we belong, our lives matter. So to go to the root for us as a people is to say we are already whole and intact. In fact, we're so whole and intact that our joy and our culture are irresistible. Our brilliance is irresistible. Our innovations are irresistible. We are philosophers and our prophecies are irresistible. You're gonna to have to contend with all of that. It's a joyful feeling when you realize that you have prophecy and you have to be contended with and you have divinity in you and all of that is, I mean, it's, it's incredible. So to me, that's, that's what we're playing with. Even if sometimes it just looks like you know, like I'll just go on Yabba Blaze Instagram every Friday and Firewater and just get my laugh on. And I'm like, that did things for my whole soul that I know connect all the way to the root. But it's that the root is available to me. Absolutely, the root, I'm all about it. Um, Kendra, could you speak to a little bit about how you define radical joy and radical healing and and through the work that you're doing with trauma-informed care and, and removing um, barriers to access, you know, where, where do you think in sy systemically and culturally, where do you think, uh, what do you think needs healing most specifically and most intentionally right now? That's a great question. And I could spend hours answering this. Um, in short, what I'll say is that for me, radical joy and healing are synonymous. Um, radical joy and healing looks like leaning and taking a deep dive into authenticity, honesty, and transparency that are undergirded in unconditional love for yourself and for whoever you deem as the other. One of the roles that I um, recently was assigned to for about four years was the associate pastor of congregational care and wellness of First Corinthian Baptist Church right here in Harlem. And in addition to that, I served as the founding executive director of Hope Center Harlem, which offers up to free up to 10 free sessions for residents of Harlem, individual couples and family counseling. And I don't know anywhere that you can go in this city or in the country where you can get access to 10 free sessions. Um, part of my role at the church was creating a care system that not only supported the parishioners of the church, but also the community of Harlem. And Spirit gave me this idea of creating this training model called Becoming a Trauma-Informed Church Training. This training model is a three-track model. The first track and each, each track is seven modules. The first track is a general trauma-informed track where I'm teaching lay leaders about adverse childhood experiences and how when people in our community or in general experience adverse childhood experiences from zero to 17, it exacerbates um, teenage pregnancy, mental health vulnerabilities, cardiovascular diseases, poverty, incarceration, all of these things. And it shows up in Black communities. Why? Because the zip code to health paradigm is real. And the zip code to health paradigm says that where your zip code is determines your access to health. And typically communities of color do not have access to mental health resources. So what can I do as a spiritual leader and as a licensed clinician to give access more. So in this training curriculum, we also do, it's in, it's interactive. And so I'm giving them case scenarios to show me if they can assess the signs and symptoms of depression, of anxiety, of trauma, since the major presentations that we saw at the Hope Center were anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder. Why? Because of the systemic racism that we exist within. Why? Because of the toxicity that we experience in our family systems that go unhealed and unchecked, um, particularly incest. I had a lot of incest cases that I um, sat with and campaigned with people on. Also sexual trauma survivors, rampant, and, and not only communities of color, but in all communities. 
And the level of secrecy that our families keep, that keep us unhealed is a cycle that still kills and destroys. So we're doing all of that work in this Becoming a Trauma-Informed Church training. The second track is a motivational interviewing lab or a skill building lab where I'm teaching these lay leaders how to um, engage in motivational interviewing, which is a therapeutic model um, that's evidence-based to support people in learning how to practice deep listening ultimately and learning how to shift people from sustained talk where we get in those cycles where we're just complaining about what we're doing even though we say we want a change but we haven't made the change so moving people from sustained talk to change talk and then the last aspect of the model is um, teaching lay leaders how to lead psychoeducation groups on anxiety and depression because if if you live in a community where you don't have access, you most likely don't have access to education where you're going to be able to go and get a master's degree um, and then go get further credentialing. So how do I give the community access to empower itself to do the healing work on its own? Um, and so for me, trauma, particularly as it relates to Black folks, we normalize it so much that we don't see it and we miss it. So a part of, as Adrian said, doing this work is looking at our own shadowy parts within us. Those parts, not only out in the world that we judge, but those parts that we have internalized that are out in the world. And, and that so many people like to point the fingers, but we don't want to do the work. And so part of joy and healing, radical joy and healing is constantly doing this work of what, of, of what it means to be born again. Because being born again is, is outside of accepting Jesus as your, your Lord and personal savior. That's not my theology. Being born again looks like doing this deep rooted healing work that Jesus taught about and lived out for ourselves so we could be able to share it with others. That's the invitation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. Uh, Toshi, I, I have a question about, um, is healing central to your work and your way of working? I've read a lot about Dr. Tear um, and the technology of soul and, and thinking about sonic vibrations as a part of raising consciousness. And that is something that they would deeply practice. I mean, do you feel that when you are performing, when you are composing, when you are facilitating sound making in, in rehearsal rooms and things of that nature. Do you see healing as central to that? Or is it like uh, just kind of a, a byproduct of what you're doing? Um, I mean, we're here because we could make sound in our bodies. That's why we're here in this particular country. Um, you know, black people, how do you do it? I mean, how do you do it? Like, how do you be at home and get captured? All kinds, there's no, 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 there's no like rejection of any age or any kind of human. You just need to be black and in that particular place in Africa, like how, how do we do it? How, how did you go and, and stand in hell? How did you stand? You stood with strangers. How, how did you do it? And how did you, you know, walk to a boat? And I always think about that because in my mind, I was like, you know, it's kind of what I'm saying, like talk to your neighbors is because how we get information can sometimes like, you know, appropriately uh, protect us from knowing everything. Sometimes we just don't need to, but sometimes it can make things seem like they were one, two, three, four, five. And then in our modern mind, whenever we hear about it, we're like on Monday, you got captured on Tuesday, you were in that horrible place on Wednesday, you was on the boat and then on the next Friday, you was like someplace on an auction block. And if it was like that, it's a thousand percent unacceptable and diabolical and horrific. But the fact that that's not what it was, that it was a, 
very, very slow journey. And, you know, our friend Alexis P. Gums has this, you know, series of marine mammal meditations. Um, and I've done some music with them, but I, I think about this all the time. Like you're getting on a boat, but you're not a person, you're an item. And so the boat's not gonna leave until it's full of its items. And so you could be on that boat for a very long time. And you know, our people were figuring out how to get off of a boat. And <laughs> you know, to keep people from figuring out how to get off of a boat, like they literally fed things so sharks would come around and people couldn't jump off and like get in the water and go back to where they needed to go and escape. You know, so we are we are here because we could sonically um, release and talk to ourselves while we were in the worst condition that we couldn't even imagine. And the vibration of your body is the possibility of making a home where no one thinks you should have one. And you might not even understand that that's what you're doing. But if you were alive when that boat landed somewhere and you were alive when people took whatever your spiritual practice was for granted and baptized you as a Christian, as they treated you horrifically and devalued your presence, you vibrated something deep inside of you that nobody could touch. And you didn't keep it to yourself. Eventually you passed it on. And it is reason why we have a legacy of information about who we are, how much we belong on this planet. It's why we have the science, which I call the science of using the Bible for everything you need to do because that's the acceptable text. So if we're gonna talk about running away, we're gonna give messages <laughs> through Bible text. And if it's not good for you, we're gonna say, we couldn't hear nobody pray. You gotta stay where you are. You know, if we're gonna- Talk, you talking. Yes. You, you can turn that, turn, turn that mute off and jump in here. Whew. So it's, my work is congregational and almost everything I do, I want a circle of people singing with me. And, um, and even though I'm in a time right now where I kind of can't have that circle. And if I do, I just, we make it up and just sing where you are. I can feel it because it's been my practice forever. And I can feel it in the same way I think my ancestors felt it. You know, that you are sometimes seeing not one single reflection of anything you value. You're not seeing one set of eyes that can look at you like they see you. Nobody is touching you for a good reason. And when you talk about labor and identifying labor, you are being overworked to a, a place that your capacity is non-existent. It just doesn't exist. It's just like, you just, you know, all of that matters and all of that is inside of all of us. And the way that we can uh, create sound and vibration, because I'm not just talking about singing and singing is amazing. But the way we can create sound and vibration is, is our testimony constant to ourselves. It's our constant saying, you are here, you are here. And if I can't say anything else, you are here and I love you, or you are here and you belong, or you are, I'm just gonna say, you are here. And every second I can say you are here is a possibility to adding on to that you are here. And, um, a lot of people ask me all the time, how come pe people in the rallies don't sing? You know, because what this country knows about a freedom movement, um, which they kind of don't want to talk about the nonviolent freedom movement, but the Southern freedom movement is they remember the songs. 
And they're like, how come, you know, they don't sing, you know? And I was like, because y'all didn't sing. Y'all learned to sing from the, the black people in the South who had a practice of singing everything. They had singing in church, singing, singing in the field, sing at children's games, sing your prayers, sing everything. You, you, if you were not in that practice, you learned from those people. And it was young people who took the songs, the sacred songs, and took the sacred sounds and the sacred harmony, harmonic structure and brought them to the movement and connected that to the powerful push for freedom. And young people now still vibrate sonically. They just don't do it the same way. So if you want to critique the singing, right? Because you're like, I don't hear them singing this little light of mine. I don't hear them singing like this. Yeah, but the chants though. But the chants though. And but but the like, you know, pulling yeah. a trap song and revitalizing it into yeah. something that's necessary though. You know, yeah. so we are we are constantly in a state of vibration because we are constantly in a state of home, even when we don't have one. Constantly. We don't <laughs> let that go. And sometimes we don't even know it. We are miserable. We are hurt. We are alone. We are violated. And if we are moaning in the process, we have a possibility. Ooh. <laughs> That's the collection. Yeah. Like just pass it to Toshi. I'm just like, girl, give me some water. I'm like, ooh, yes. <laughs> that is just like, ah, uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. See, see why we gonna be okay? We got preachers right now, and we're gonna be okay. a bunch of queer black people everywhere. Yes, yes. Ah, yes. uh, okay. Uh, okay. So the next thing. Um, okay, what are we? What time are we at? Okay. We got we have have until seven p.m. Oh, okay, great. So now, okay. now I'm like, who? Ah, ah, ah. uh, all right. So we need a love affair. This is something. This is this is a piece of an article that I read, um, where Dr. Tear is talking about a a a survey that her and her company of actors completed in Harlem in the 1960s because they wanted to get a sense of what Black people at that time thought about their futures thought about their relationship to each other in that moment, and thought about Black culture in America more broadly. Um, and the results of that survey led her to describe it as such. So I'm gonna read some quotes that she, um, she said, and then we'll talk, we'll, we'll unpack what that, what that was about. So let me pull this up here. The results were, how come if everybody is so black and proud, Harlem, the largest black community in the United States is dying. We are saying that people in the black community do not talk to each other. It is a community without love and a community needs love to live. I say that because if we had love for ourselves and those like us, we would not commit negative acts nor tolerate negative conditions as we do. Black people need to release this spiritual power Christianity has so turned us off from religion that we don't believe in anything, not even ourselves. And we need to believe in ourselves. To do this, we need to learn to love ourselves. For only by loving ourselves can we gain the will, the power to eliminate our oppression. We are taking the size five dresses off our size 15 bodies. Um, and so I wanted to start with you, Kendra. Uh, just your thoughts on Dr. Tears' assessment of the spiritual state of Blackness in the 1960s. Do you agree or disagree with what she was observing? Uh, and do you see any vestiges of this lovelessness um, that she was describing through this survey? I think that Dr. Tears' assessment is prophetic. I think that not, not only is that how Black people were showing up in the world and experiencing the world at that time, but also now, because we have forgotten that we are gods. Psalm 82.6 reminds us that 
we are we are we are children of the most high we are gods i mean jesus even alludes to it when he's in john talking to the pharisees and sadducees and they're asking him why are you calling yourself the son of god they call him a blasphemer but jesus was clear that he was a divine soul that's why he knew that we could do these and greater things you cannot do these and greater things if you don't believe that you are divine it is just not possible so this moment of revival is calling us back to our divine selves and the spiritual technology that our ancestors used that um colonialism and white supremacy has made us afraid of bring your ancestral altars back bring bring the altars for the orisha back like it is it is time now for us to be afraid no more um and part of of when you forget who you are when you forget that you you are the god um that's been created by the big god you start making institutions and men and women outside of yourself god and that is where we are we 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 need to remember who we are. Yeah. Adrian Toshi, if you want to weigh in on this, please. I'm just over here praying. I'm just like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like it's interesting because I come at it from a different orientation, right? So like I was raised in, in the church, um, but in most of my adult life, I have found nature to be the, the cathedral for me. And that I, that's the place where I am, that's the place where I have felt belonging and I have felt accepted, but it's the same act that's needed there, which is turning and bringing our attention back into a, a process I think of as, as re-indigenization, right? Just like, how do I bring myself back into relationship, my divine relationship as being something of a divine world, an abundant world? How do I relinquish the mythology of scarcity that contains my very being and what are the practices I do for that and I've really been like this this pandemic has created such an interesting like a, a squeeze a container inside of which I've had to really become creative about like well what is it I need to thrive what is it I need to nourish myself and live and then how do I be in relationship with other people nourishing ourselves and living um, that we will not die and that I turn and I, I find myself uh, recently, I've been going on walks around this neighborhood. And you know, everybody, anybody who's been like, I pandemic walking is like, I know every leaf, I know every tree, I know every turn, I know every little loop, you know, it's just like, this is the only walk I can go on. And there's this one tree that has been calling to me and calling to me every time I walk by, I'm like, you are so pretty. Gosh, you're gorgeous, big, fat, just fatter and fatter the further down you go. Like that's the kind of shape I like in myself and others. So I was like, tree, you got it going on. You know, we ain't talking. Then my therapist was like, Adrian, you really need to find some cedar to work with. Cedar would be a, a plant medicine that could really help you right now, that could help you ground yourself. And then I'm going on the walk again the next day after she said this. And I stopped by that tree and I was like, let me just see what this tree is. I don't know what this tree is. And I had this app and I looked and of course it's an Eastern red cedar. And it's just like, of course you knew that this was the medicine you needed. I knew that that was the medicine I needed. And so I, I keep thinking like, how do we awaken, right? That divine part of ourselves that knows the medicine we need. And how do we remind our all of our people no matter where we are, how concrete the world is around us, we can look up and see stars, or we can look and see the little tree that's growing in the concrete. Like life keeps moving towards life as we have always done, as we know how to do. How do we remember that? That even in this moment, especially in this moment, we have leadership that is not trustworthy. And we have to be then in a very ritual practice of moving towards life and just being like, no, we will not die. We will not let you, uh, we will not let you send us to death. You know, I think it's the everyday, you know, like I love, I keep my ancestor altar. I keep my altar set up, but I also really believe in the ritual of, of every movement. Like how do I make every single thing I'm doing? This is my prayer. This is my prayerful eating. This is my prayerful walking. This is my prayerful connecting. If I'm in a meeting with other people, it's like, this is our miraculous time. Right now, we did not create the miracle of our lives. This was gifted to us. We should not waste the miracle 
our lives, the more present and the more miraculous we hold it, the more life we end up with. It's my friend Prentice calls it, how do we expand black time? And I think of it that way as like time play, time bending, right? That we can do so much with time when we start to drop into it and remember, oh, it's not linear. We are co-creating and shaping what it can be. How do we, how do we then do that towards justice, towards right relationship with each other and with the earth? And Toshi talks about this all the time, but to me, it's easy to watch our, our attention just go boom, 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 boom. There's always a crisis. There's always something that could pull us all the way out of ourselves. And those who want to continue to enslave us, they benefit so much from our short attention spans and from our inability to focus. Capitalism benefits so much from being able to constantly bring our attention to whatever it wants us to purchase. Capitalism benefits from us not thinking well of ourselves and not remembering we are divine and already have everything we need. If you think you're not shit, you go buy it. You know, if you think you're not pretty, you go try to buy it. You think you're not healthy and your body is not right, you try to go buy something. And I'm like, it's just an interesting moment right now to be black and be like, I could be conscious of shaping a future in which I don't have to go outside of myself and my community to meet my needs. We can be in mutual aid. We can be in community support. We don't need the police. We know that now, right? There's ways that we're going backward to things that are people's new, but modernizing into, oh, and now we have a different technology to support mediation, to support community accountability, to support actually giving ourselves mental health support instead of calling the police when our folks are struggling. There's just so much possible right now if we drop in and expand the time and remember, oh, I'm inside this moment as a divine being who will co-create the future. I'm not here by accident. My ancestors delivered me to this moment as I will deliver the next people to the, you know, whatever I co-create now, Good. that's everything that my babies are gonna get to live to. That's on us, it's on us. There's no time to waste. I keep being in that balance too of, you know, I hear Ella Baker in one year, like we who believe in freedom cannot rest. And I'm over here with Trisha Hershey and the nap ministry over here and we need to take a nap. And then like in the middle, it's like, what we need to do is be fully present. We have earned the right to rest in this moment and we will never maybe earn the right to rest politically, right? I'm like, politically, we have to keep on marching, keep on trucking, keep on moving and take advantage of the opportunity. I wanna lift up something in this moment too, that I, I, in my facilitation, I support the movement for black lives and I have been blown away, like so honored. Literally every time they call to be like, can you help with this? I'm like, thank you so much for letting me serve you. Cause I'm just like blown away by what is and how hard they have worked in the relationship, the core of the math turning. But the BREATHE Act is something that their policy table is now unveiling, unfolding. And it's saying, at the civil rights era, we engaged in movement and uprising, and then it led to the Civil Rights Act, and we had to move it into legislation and policy so that we didn't lose the opportunity of the moment. And now we're in a similar moment where all this uprising has to lead to something at the federal level that we can hold our politicians, hold our leaders accountable to. So the BREATHE Act, they just did a massive launch. It was outstanding. Gina Clayton Johnson is, is at the helm of it as a new mother, Black beauty, gorgeous, brilliant leader. Um, and Jessica Bird and all these other folks are in there just helping us understand like how do we take what's in the streets and put it into policy that we can then hold everyone accountable to. So I just am like, there's ways that we're like, oh, let's reach back. What did our ancestors do well? What did future generations do well? How did they practice their divinity? How do we practice ours? How do we make sure the next generation has a faster claim to it? I want every baby now I meet to be like, you're God, you know that? That's what you need to know. I'm not gonna tell you to speak unless you're not speak unless you're spoken to. I'm gonna tell you to sing out as loud as you can because you're divine, we need you. So anyway, I'm going all over the place, but it's, I feel very alive. That's all that's happening. How do you how do y'all suggest we keep we we keep this connection to joy? How how do you how do you suggest we start a practice of of doing this so that we can sustain it um, and really start on that journey? And I don't know who wants to start us off. This will kind of be the last question I pose. I'm gonna check on the Facebook live chat, but um but yeah, just this question of joy. How do we connect to it? The um, first thing. Oh, go, oh, go no. ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. You know, 
<laughs> um, I was gonna kind of kind of just on the question that you they y'all just answered everything so well, and I can connect it to this question. It is, you know, sometimes the web actually gets you, and um, and it, these are systems of webs that are really they're well financed. They're they're long term projected like thought out like processed webbing and and you know you can just go like this around you and just pick any things that you participate in every day you know the zoom you know any of the social media um food all of the things we talked about um everything that's horrible has been really really invested in and is is, is being held so deeply like it's it's like you could really let go of hatred of black people like it just doesn't it's not even necessary you know anymore it doesn't it doesn't work it's not nobody is getting happy off of it nobody is everybody looks crazy with their guns and crazy with their i'm not gonna let you have your black like you know, all lives matter blue lives matter everybody matters and you know everybody's like like look at people they have distortions of their beautiful selves. I don't care what race they are, you know? And people who are like in their right minds are, look, are, are walking like this. And they have levels of adrenaline, right? You know, when I, when I don't feel, when I feel like I'm being heard, when I march, I march one way. When I feel like I have to let you know what time it is, I march a different way. There is an arsenal of possibilities, the same way Reverend Kendra has gears and preaching, hallelujah, <laughs> I can already tell, <laughs> cannot wait to come to service, <laughs> has gears, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, um, but that, the web, the web gets you, and not only does it get you, but it can set you in a state of being where your own people don't want to have anything to do with you and don't want to come and see you, don't want, when they see you approach, they can tell you've been got and you formed into something that they can't recognize. Mm -hmm. And they actually walk the other way to protect themselves. And Octavia deals with this so much in her work, but in Parable, like Parable is the escalation where you literally, an, a a block, a neighborhood, a cul-de-sac chooses to wall themselves in and never like have freedom outside of themselves unless they're like really w willing to risk a severe danger because this winding systemic like intentional force against life is in effect and successful. You know, and so the medicine and the antidotes, you know, that have been spoken about, have we have to do that thing with time, and we have to do that thing with, um, what's the word, when you interrupt, and you interrupt something that's already in process, and you divert its will. And that is like such a massive undertaking or overtaking or taking, taking, because it is like you, you have to be a practitioner that is willing to move through dangerous places because people are in state of danger. And there is no system, right? like in the huge pot that we all pay into to create all of this joint, you know, everything, our socialist system of governing avoids participation in that. It takes all of the resources and it uses them actually to do the opposite thing. And it makes it weird that you would want like preschools and that you would want books and that you would want, um, housing and that you would want a living wage, all of the things that are sustainable and that give us opportunities to heal 
like the old wounds of the, the old webbing and the contemporary web webbing and its new wounds. So as we are like really struggling for eons around incarceration, struggling for eons around rape of, of, of women and children and humans of all kinds, now struggling for acceptance of trans people and non-binary people, why is that a struggle? Like why in our communities do we even have to spend five minutes saying like, this is who I am and I need you to call me by my name, right? But it's like that, that work that we are, we are doing now and we have been doing is also revealing, you know, what Dr. Tear said. Like all she said is like, look, this is also who we are. And, you know, if that's the late sixties and you move up to now, you can see like, well, we have like more practitioners. We are more wider who we are. Actually, lots of us um, have the lights going on and, you know, and we still have to deal with this webbing and we still have to deal with the physical memory and we still have to deal with the constant abuse. And we are still like in a state of praise and exhaustion simultaneously. So it's like, you know, I was, I'm like, I want people to know, like, I see that you got got, you know? And I see like, most of y'all got got, I don't even know how to get close to. And I can see like the ways that I got got. You know, and I have a practice around like releasing and I get to sing and I get to be a person, but it's, it is like also really important to really hold the fact that simultaneously to our revolution is that like, we have to take these people, ourselves, our wounds, our gotness our everything it's coming with us and if we are not like in a practice of of a really you know um restorative justice on the bodies and souls spirits and minds of our own people when we get to our different levels we're all they're always going to be there <laughs> like right there so you know you know what i'm saying like it's, exactly. it's yeah and so joy isn't it such a powerful ingredient? And it's such an, an, an important um, manifestation of existence because if we can also like really call it the sacred, you know, emotion, sacred system, just like the one that vibrates and offers you home, Joy can happen to you when you're freaking miserable. Joy can happen to you like before you, you understood something was happening, it flipped by you and you smiled. You know, joy can revitalize a small part of you and give you an opportunity and em empathetic joy. A bunch of people catching the spirit at the same time, a bunch of people in a place and knowing at the same time can last forever. And I just, because I just got to say something about the theater, because you said this was our last, our last question. But I grew up at DC Black Repertory Company and DC Black Repertory Company um, probably was like, you know, a relative of National Black Theater. Um, it was started by Robert Hooks. My mom, Bernice Johnson Regan was the music director and we got moved from Atlanta um, arrived in DC and, and I think 1971, 72, so very much in that same energetic sphere. And they took an old movie theater and they turned it into a theater theater and they had a dance company and a theater company. And my mom took us everywhere she went. And so I got to watch, in fact, this is my theater training. That's that I have never studied theater anything. I have never studied anything. I watched young black people create work together. I am telling you, like make theater all the time. Like you make it all the time, make your plays, 
make your musicals, make your, do your dance shows. Like, I don't care, a little bit of money, a lot of money, no money, like do it everywhere in the house, on the playground, in the church, you know, <laughs> in, in any space. Theater, I think, is, is one of the reasons why I just ran to get Parable and do it in theater is because people come to it and you have the opportunity to create and reflect a, a truth, even though, you know, you made it up. And all of the ingredients that we've talked about tonight can occupy a theater space and every, every single thing. And the theater space, like, it's so important that that building got created and that those rooms are what they, what they are and what they're gonna be. Because it is so important that it's same thing with DC Black Repertory Company. They didn't have to do the work of finding a space. They built the space and then they put everything in it. And Sweet Honey in the Rock came out of DC Black Repertory Company. And Sweet Honey Rock is 45 years old. So it's like when you talk about the possibility of so many actors, so many great writers, so many amazing people came out of that. So theater is like, even if you don't have the building and even if you are just doing it, it's a, it's a possibility of congregational um, creation that can live beyond yourself. If you, like how we're talking about how doc, what Dr. Tier wrote and what Dr. Tier said, and then her Dr. Tier surveys, Dr. Tier's building, Dr. Tier's everything, lives beyond herself and makes her ever, ever living. So, loops all of that together. <laughs> Man, Toshi, I, I can just take notes as you're speaking. Um, shout out to um, your mom. I mean, Sweet Honey and the Rock, I was introduced to them when I was like 13 by an uncle of mine. So they keep me centered in my joy. Uh, and thank you for all that you do, Adrian. Thank you. This has been such a rich conversation. Um, one of the things that comes to mind is at the Hope Center, one of the initiatives that I started a couple of years ago was this retreat called Breaking Bread Interfaith Retreat, where I would take um, innovators of the Hope Center, because we don't call them patients or clients, because we want to destigmatize Black folks um, getting access to mental health. So we're innovators. Everybody is an innovator. So I took a group of innovators um, once a year to this retreat space where we partnered with Buddhist monks and nuns to give them access to another modality of healing. And throughout that weekend retreat, what we do is simply teach folks not only how to meditate but to breathe i think one way that you stay centered in your joy is by recognizing that deep breaths are medicinal Deep breaths are medicine. 70% of our toxins are released through our breath. And we only use a third of our respiratory systems. So that means that we are not breathing. When we are able to take deep breaths, we oxygenate our brain cells and we give our mind time to stop and think. Because we are up under the thumb of capitalism and various oppressions, racism, homophobia, et cetera, it can be difficult to slow down and breathe. We must prioritize the breath and our breathing. It will be the only free therapist that we can have for an extended period of time. So that's my offering. That's how we stay connected to joy. Ooh, all right. I would say the last little bit is do not fake it. Do not fake it. So, you know, the body teaches us this. If you fake your orgasms, you don't get orgasms, right? It's the same thing in life. If you fake the joy, if you fake the funk, nobody can reach you with joy. Nobody understands you don't have it. People can feel inauthenticity in you. And in this moment, I keep noticing that if I wanna have joy in my day, I have to acknowledge my terror. I have to acknowledge that I am terrified of some of the changes that are happening. I have to acknowledge the grief that I'm already in for people we've lost, anticipatory grief for the people we're going to lose. I have to acknowledge that the climate crisis and black police brutality against black people and indigenous folks being raided. And like, I have to acknowledge that I feel all of that, that I am an empath 
and I have to find the channels that let that move through me. And if I just fake that and come in and be like, hey guys, it's great. People can feel that I'm, I'm, I'm basically, um, you know, trying to put a nice glossy perfume over a pile of dirt or trash or something, you know? Mm. And if I let it clear through me and go all the way down to the ground, if I say I need help sometimes, so, you know, if I'm like, I need my therapist and a Qigong helper, I need my lover to hold me and I need my parents to listen to me and I need, you know, then I let release all of that real feeling, the whole wide range, right? Joy is part of a wide range. When you're feeling joy, it necessitates that you're able to feel that whole range, right? So we're never asking someone, let go of your grief, put down your sadness, come to joy. It's in addition to that sadness, notice, ah, oh, that sadness carves out space for joy. The joy will also carve out space for your future grief. I always say you're falling in love is signing on for future grief, but it's worth it. It's worth it because then you're gonna get the whole full experience of life over and over again. Always fall in love, always love your work, always take the risk of moving into work that deeply moves you and don't fake it. Do not fake it. Right now we don't need any fake news, we don't need fake emotions. We don't need fake friendships. We don't need fake leadership. We need authenticity, real joy. We deserve real joy, black joy. That's my offer. Ashe. Hey, Ashe. Okay. Ashe. <laughs> hey. <laughs> we've got, we got, well, let's see. Yeah. One so minute we're left. Like, one minute left. One minute left. <laughs> and with that one minute, I'm going to pose this question. And we'll see. We'll see. You're bold, Chelsea. I know. I'm just I'm a real bold. Okay. So from Chisa, this is from the Facebook live chat. Okay. Chisa would like to know, um, to those trying to exercise pleasure activism, how do you engage with or disengage from people who insist on pinning you in the space of suffering? More specifically, how do you maintain your joy while appreciating the sentiments of folks who are either late to the struggle or only recognize the struggle? My friend Prentice Hemphills taught us that boundaries are the distance at which I can love you and myself simultaneously. Hmm. So if someone cannot see your joy, there's just a boundary. That's just a boundary mm -hmm. you need to set. It's like you, and it can be internal. I won't mm. let that person as deeply into my heart until they are able to access their full range of emotions more clearly. If anyone's trying to take your joy, we just don't have time for it right now. They, that's their work. That's not your work. Mm. It's always nice if you can articulate it, if you can say, hey, you know, right now I need to protect my joy. And mm. so I'm gonna disengage. I get off phone calls sometimes like that. I, <laughs> I'm famous for that. <laughs> like, I'm on this meeting, but it is not bringing me joy. I'm gonna go, I love y'all. And I'll talk to you later. <laughs> so. Look, I'm about it. Oh, this can is I jump on that? That's crazy. Yes, jump please, please, please. Um, please. Do it. Adrian hit the nail on the head. I want to offer this as a clinician. We have a personal boundary system, every human being. Your personal mm -hmm. boundary system, as Adrian said, is made up of your internal boundary and your external external boundary. Internal boundaries, when you have a healthy internal boundary, it allows us to have disagreement. And I don't feel some type of way because you disagree with me because I haven't internalized that what you believe is my belief. And right. so for that person that asks that question, external boundaries are for like physical, your physical boundaries. But for the person that asks that question, you have to realize that it is not your work to try to get them to change or to try to control them. Your work is to vibrate in the center of joy at all times. And what that requires of you is to do your work. Mm -hmm. You gotta do your work because there's always going to be people around you who will attempt to take you outside of your joy. But when you're doing your healing work, you are less susceptible to the judgments of people and the projections of people around you. Mm -hmm. Ashe. Ashe. Beautiful. Thank you, y'all. And it, and it's 701. Like, yeah, this is just... thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this thank is you. like this journey so we so rich. Oh, thank you. Rich. Yeah. <laughs> very good. Very, very good. Thank you. I'm gonna go eat I'm my joyful so, dinner yeah. now. Please. Like Please. Oh, <laughs> Thanks for joining us. MBT at Home Founders Month Edition, part three. Join us next week for the last combo. Peace. See y'all then. <laughs> Peace. Bye, y'all.